Hi, I'm Steve Borey, and I am the author of the American Casino Guide book. If you're not familiar with us, please be sure to visit our website at AmericanCasinoGuidebook.com. Joining me today is Matt Borey. Hey, everybody. I'm the editor of the American Casino Guide book, and our video today is on the $20 million Baccarat scandal involving Phil Ivey. All right, so today we're going to be interviewing Bill Zender, who is a consultant for casinos and specializes in game protection for table games. And we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to recap this whole uh, Baccarat cheating scandal that happened uh, years ago with Phil Ivey and uh, get his professional opinion on whether or not he thought it was cheating. Bill Zender, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Steve. How are you doing? I am doing well, thank you. And uh, Matt's here with us, and, and we're going to ask you a couple of questions today. We're trying to get some uh, background information on the on the Phil Ivy Baccarat scandal. He uh, won over twenty million dollars. It was uh, all over the place. Sixty Minutes did a story on it. Uh, it's all over the internet. And, and basically, some some people said he was cheating. Some people said it was an advantage play. So so we're trying to get some in input from you because you are the uh, casino expert. You are a uh, casino gaming consultant. You specialize in table game protection for the casinos. You're, and uh, you also you do management training, table game performance evaluations. And you've uh, also been an uh, expert witness in court for gambling cases. And you also, uh, you're the author of several books. Anything else you want to throw in there? No, oh, I don't know. Geez, that sounds really good to me. <laughs> Well, let me ask you a question, Bill. So uh, when it says that you were an expert witness, what did those cases involve? That was like you, uh, if somebody was accused of cheating and you went in and, and, and testified whether or not, whether it was cheating or whether it was advantage play or? Well, well, Matt, I get asked the same question when I'm on the stand. They'll ask me what my experience is. And I always tell them, like, I testify in gaming cases, uh, table game cases, um, and I, te I test in civil and criminal cases my criminal cases are mostly for the prosecution, although I've done a couple for the defense. And my civil cases are, are either side. Um, I will not testify if I don't think that, uh, I, you know, I won't, I won't testify if I don't think that what they're trying to do is right. Okay. I've actually testified uh, for advantage players because I thought they were unjustly handled. And I've actually testified in a criminal case for a dealer that was unjustly accused. So it kind of, of gives what you... coerce like coercing with a player. Well, no, what happened was a, uh, I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, it was kind of a barrier. We got a, uh, he was found out guilty, but what the, what the state did was a, uh, they thought that he was cheating at roulette by, uh, they said he was pacing the wheel with the ball mm -hmm. to fall, to drive the ball into pockets where people were betting, uh, betting for him. And then they went and cherry picked the, the uh, video review and uh, they showed like six incidences where the ball always fell in that pocket. And of course, that's not right. So we blew holes through it and showed that the, he didn't even try. It was, it was completely innocent on that one. But oh, to, that's good. But to give you an idea, I would suggest that of all the ones, I've, in an, I've got, I couldn't even count them up now, is mostly in, in Baccarat. Oh, Okay. Well, all right. good thing that's what we're talking about today. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so what we're gonna do is, Matt and I did some research and we, and we went out and we, we saw what was out on the internet. And so we're gonna give the timeline of, of what we saw and what we read, and then we're gonna get your impression as to whether or not that's accurate. And maybe you can get a little more background information. And then you're gonna explain how they were able to get away with this uh, win of $20 million. Uh, so, okay. So for, for anyone who doesn't know who Phil Ivey is, he's like the, the, fam the, the most famous poker player in the world. He's uh, won uh, 10 World Series of Poker bracelets. And in, as of 2018, he had won more than $26 million playing poker. So now in 2012, he went to the Borgata Casino in Atlantic City, and he had a partner who played Baccarat with him. Uh, Kelly's son, I think is her name, and they won $9.6 million and the casino paid them the money. So what do you think of that so far? 
Well, I think so far you're, you're correct. You're on the right uh, page there. Um, one of the things that doesn't come out in the news is that Phil Ivey and Kelly Sun uh, actually went in and played four different occasions at Brigada that, that year. They started out sometime in the spring, and I'm, I'm thinking they started in March. And he, they went in on, def, on those occasions until August, which was their fourth occasion. And that's when uh, the Brigada had found out that, uh, that their play might not be uh, totally, uh, let's say, honest. So, okay, because now we have a, this other case where they went to London and they played there. So in, in August of that same year, they went to Crockford's Casino in London and they won 7.7 .7 million pounds, which is approximately $11 million. And they won that in two days. And uh, Crockford's thought the win was a little suspicious. So they didn't give him his money and they said they would give it to him later. But all they did was they refunded the, the original million pounds that he had put up, and they said they weren't going to pay him the, the rest of the money. Yeah, that's um, when uh, what he did was he and Kelly's son went into the Croxfords, and Kelly is actually part of the team. Phil Ivey was nothing but a face with a bankroll. This is not his idea. So Kelly's son was part of a team that had, had come in and terrorized Las Vegas for about 10 months. Uh, uh, in 2010, 2011, they had already scoped out the casino and found that the playing cards that they had on the table had uh, some of the some of the cards were cut wrong, so they had a, a, a wider pattern on one side than the other. Um, so subsequently, Kelly and Phil went there and they played on the game and uh, they found some cards that uh, they could manipulate and create this uh, pattern, which is called a sort pattern. Now, was and, it, uh, let me ask you here before I uh, forget, don't mean to cut you off, but was it, it was it like a certain brand of cards or it was a certain design on the back of the cards or what was it? Was there a specific thing? Like, I assume it was not something every casino had, right? Right, well, just uh, do me a favor, steer me back on course after I get through explaining this one. Okay. All cards, all casino quality cards have this problem. And the reason they do is when they print the cards, they print them in big sheets and they adjust the machine. And the first sheet that slides down the, the machine, when they cut it one way, then it turns and they cut the other way and it drops down and they package it. And the, uh, what, what happens is every time that sheet, even though they're not real heavy, they have some weight, they hit the machine, hit the machine. And after, I don't know how many ME sheets are printed, let's say 1,000, 5,000 sheets, then the machine, when it cuts, is off a little bit. So when we start the cut, we start the process of printing, the first ones are cut probably perfectly. And then when they get towards the end of the run, they're not cut so well. Now, a lot of the card companies will do is they'll stop, readjust, and then print again. But every time they stop, it costs them money. So they try to run as many as they can through there. So you could you can find anything. We find we can find b we can find Hoyle, we can find uh, uh, Jamaica, we can find Car Cardamunde, uh, and we will find those blemishes uh, in some of the cards. Some of them will be perfect. I'm saying blemishes, this is called sorts. We'll find those sorts, but in most cases, we'll also find perfectly cut cards. Okay. All right. Now, what they did was uh, that Kelly and Kelly had gone out and they had, they had actually uh, looked at all the different casinos in uh, London. And for some reason, they really liked Croxfords and they really liked this back pattern. So they got in there and they found, her and Phil found a game where the back patterns of the eight deck Baccarat shoes were all the same. Uh, and they were, they, were, they were sortable. So she sat down on the table and basically what they did was they talked the the marketing and casino management. I'm, I'm sorry, but can we show the, uh, uh, the power? You, you did a whole PowerPoint presentation on this. Yes. yes. And okay. We can so, show yeah, that while, while you're talking. All right. So these, this is the design that you're talking right. about is this diamond pattern. This is what they were using, right? And this, and this isn't the, this isn't the cards they were using there, but this is a good illustrator because go to the, go to the next slide, uh, Matt. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, you know, you see where the circles are? Mm -hmm. Now, we'll take the, the, take the card on the right side. You'll see that there's like a three quarters of a diamond on the right edge of the card. Mm -hmm. But on the left side, there's only one quarter diamond, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Now go to the next card. You'll see on the right side of that, you'll see a, about a half thirds of a diamond on the other side you only see a third uh -huh. so those are like two kind of cards one of them is even cut worse than the other one is but if you get real good and train your eyes you can you can spin these cards and they're actually they, you can actually treat them as marked cards uh -huh. so these are casino these aren't here but you have casino quality cards that you could actually find that if you turn them okay uh -huh. uh, you could turn uh, you know, certain cards one way and certain cards another. Now, and the whole reason this worked is because uh, they were betting a lot of money. And when you bet a lot of money, uh, casinos tend to bend over backwards and do uh, uh, meet any silly requests that you have because Baccarat players uh, tend to be very uh, superstitious people. So there's, I, I've heard stories of like, if you go to these like out in Macau where the people are betting millions of dollars at a time, they, they have all these crazy suspicions and they let the people bend the cards and do all sorts of stuff like that. So that was sort of following that same pattern, right? Where, where they were just betting a lot of money and getting the casino to do them uh, their requests for them, correct? Well, you know, Matt, uh, they, brought, they brought Phil in, Phil Ivy in because he was a face. Now he also brought the bank, from what I understand, he brought the bankroll in with him as well. So they said, well, Mr. Ivy's here. What does Mr. Ivy want? Well, Mr. Ivy wants you to change your dealing procedure a little bit. So the casinos, they deal the cards out. They'll deal four cards out. And then when they go to turn them over, they'll take from the top of the card and they'll turn them over. So they'll turn them over lengthwise. So I turn the, and, and how, the, how the dealing procedure goes. Two cards go to the player, two cards go to the bank. So the dealer reaches down and turns over the first two cards that go to the player, end over end, turns the cards that go to the banker, end over end, okay? Now, when you turn them end over end, what you do, you're not really changing the direction. It's when you turn the cards side by side is when they would change. Okay. So what the first thing they have to do is they have to go in and they have to get the casino to change their procedures. Okay. And so they say, hey, you know, we're not, you know, we're superstitious, like you pointed out, Matt. So we want, instead of you just turning end over end, we want to be able to do is the dealer lift up the card, we'll look at it. And if we like it, we think it's a lucky card, turn end over end. But if they bring it up and we don't like it, we want to turn it side over side. So what they were doing is the players weren't sorting the cards the players were influencing the dealers to sort the cards, or I should say manipulating the dealers to sort the cards for them. It, the funny part is they're doing this with management's approval because management didn't see the, the problem with this, where Kelly's son knew that if they could arrange the cards and they could play them off the top of the shoe and they knew, and I, we'll get into the ranging, they, they knew that a nine, eight, and seven were at the top of the shoe, they would bet on the player. And if there was any other card, they would bet on the banker, okay? And that would be because due to the rules of Baccarat, uh, seven, eight, and nine are considered a natural, so they never pull another card, right? Well, the thing is, it's, it's seven, eights, and nines become strong, okay? Because they're gonna, you're going to have a higher, uh, a higher uh, win frequency. Turn, I think it's the next slide on here. Uh, man. Well, let me let me let me jump in here one second, though, please. For people who are not familiar with the game of baccarat, uh, the, the the idea is to get a total as close to nine as possible. So whoever gets and there, and there's two hands they deal, a, a, a player and a banker, and whichever one winds up uh, getting closer to nine wins the hand. And the casino has to follow certain rules. They don't have any discretion as to whether or not to take a card. And, and uh, so whoever gets a total closest to nine, and you just add the total of the cards together. If you have a four and a five, that's a nine. If you have a one and a two, that's a three. And, and uh, z uh, 10 value cards count as zero. So if you had an eight, eight and a 10, that would count as eight. So that's the ultimate goal is to get a total as close to nine as possible. So that's how you, how you play Baccarat. Mm -hmm. Now, 
we look so this, at the, this slide here is sort of this is just showing how they were uh, telling the difference of the cards, right? It was that little that little uh, right. horseshoe shaped window in, in the the shoe is what they were uh, looking at, correct? Correct. And the thing is, is that I on this I've used these slides in my presentations on game protection, and the matter of fact, advance to the next slide, Matt. Okay. Mm -hmm. What I've done is I circled the area of the card. And what I did is you really can't see the enlarged diamond down there. But what I've done is I've taken a highlighter and highlighted it. So what, what Kelly's son was doing is after she got the dealers to manipulate the cards and sort them the way she wanted, anytime she looked at the shoe at the beginning of the hand, and she saw there was a, a, a card with a big diamond, which would indicate seven, eight, or nine. Then she, what she would do is she would instruct Phil Ivey to bet on the player's hand. If she did not see one of those, she would law, uh, Phil automatically bet on the banker, right? And, the, and once you bring the next slide up, Matt. And, and that first card always goes to the player. So if she saw seven, eight, or nine, that's why she told him to bet on player because she knew that was a very valuable card for the player to get, correct? Exactly, exactly. And you know, it's it, for the people out there that don't understand Bakra, this is a little confusing. So the, what basically what you need to do is just can understand that the top card of the shoe is extremely important. And if we know the value of it, we can gain an advantage over the casino. Now this, this here, this chart, this was compiled by Dr. Elliot Jacobson and, and, and Elliot is a noted mathematician and does a lot of gaming consulting work himself. So what he said, if, you, if the card on the top of the shoe is an ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or 10 value cards, 10 being from 10, jack, queen, and king, mm -hmm. that if that's at the top of the shoe, if you bet on the player, let's say, let's say an ace, if you bet on a player, you're betting with a disadvantage. You're betting it. You're, you're going to lose 7.8 percent of your money. But if you bet on the bank bet, because you in Bakra you had those two bets. You can bet player. You can bet banker. Is if I bet on the banker bet, I actually have a five point, roughly four percent advantage. Now, if we go down that that chart, you'll see. Um, and I'm not going to yeah, count. The at, at, you'll see at the top of the chart the first ace two three four five is in the, you have an advantage betting the banker if you know Thank what that you. first card is. And then once you get to the six, uh, you'll see it jumps over to the uh, player advantage. Now a six is not a very good advantage. Seven, seven, yeah. uh, three quarters of 1% is not very good, but as you see, seven, eight, and nine get a much, much higher. And Matt, what, from what I understand is Kelly son had decided not to turn the sixes the same direction as seven, eights and nines. Mm -hmm. So what they did was they just turned the seven, eights, and nine. So you've got one card, the seven, eights, and nines turn one way, and the the other cards, other than seven, eight, nine, turn the opposite way. Now, once you go to the next screen, mm -hmm. there we go. Okay. Now I included the six on this one, but you can see on top is if there was a nine, eight, or eight, nine, eight, seven, and I even included six, but it's just a marginal. Uh, it's not going to change anything. If you see that on top of the shoe, that's all you know. You don't know if it's a nine or eight or seven, but you're playing with about a 12% edge. If that's one of those cards and you bet on the player, but if you don't see one of those cards, you bet on the banker and you have a 5% edge and it comes out to an average of right around 7% player edge, which is pretty strong. Because that was seven percent might not sound like a lot to people that don't gamble, but to advantage players, huge. a six point seven percent edge over the house is huge. But mm -hmm. you figured that the in Baccarat, the house, a normal standard house game, has an average of 1.15, 1.2% .1 advantage over the players. Uh, we're talking uh, six six times stronger here. So it's just in the player's even, favor. Right. And you're not turning the tables on the casino. You're turning it over and over and over and over and over again because it's yeah. really large rain. Yeah. So, so, so the, and, and just to, to put it into simple terms, I think most people that card count, if you card count and you have a 2% edge, that's considered a gold mine. So this should uh, uh, be even better than that. It's well, almost well, four times better than that. 
Steve, if you get a 2% edge and you're doing really good because oh, yeah. actually professionals are trying to get a 1% edge. So this, this is very, very strong. Mm -hmm. All right, now, did you have another slide you wanted to do here? Do you want me to go into what happened next Let's with just, the casinos asking for their money back? This point, and uh, we'll just go back to discussion. Okay. All right, so, so they won this money, $20, $20 million. Borgata paid them, uh, Crockford's didn't. So what happened? is Ivy sued Crockford for not giving him his winnings. And in 2016, took four years, a court ruled in favor of the casino because they said edge sorting, which is the process we were talking about here, the advantage the, uh, that the players were using called edge sorting. They, the judge said it was not a legitimate strategy and was cheating for the purposes of civil law. So Ivy appealed that and the next year, five, uh, justices unanimously upheld the previous decision and dismissed the case. So he never got the money from Crockford that he won. Sound right, Bill? Yes, that, that sounds about right, yep. Okay. So later, Borgata found out about what was going on at Crockford, as you had mentioned, and they filed a lawsuit against Ivy and Chung to get their $10 million back. And in 2016, a federal court ruled that they had to pay back $10 million. The judge ruled that they did not commit fraud, but did breach their contract with the casino. He found that they did not abide by a New Jersey Casino Controls Act provision that prohibited marking cards, even though they didn't actually mark the cards. Ivy appealed that ruling, and in July 2020, that was eight years after he won the money, the two sides agreed to a settlement and it remains confidential that they, they never released it. So it's interesting that in both cases, the judges ruled that there was some form of cheating, but Ivy always said he con considered himself an advantage player and not a cheater because he never touched the cards. So being in the business of protecting the casino from cheaters and understanding what advantage players do, what is your opinion on the case? This is my opinion of it. I'm going to I'm going to get a, a bunch of casino people upset with me. But <laughs> it's an advantage play. Okay. And in and he said, well, you know, I can't argue with a federal judge. Federal judge says it. You know, you just read about that. Said it was it was a civil it was civil cheating, which I don't understand that. Um, first of all, why do I say that? The cards that the, that that uh, Phil Ivey and Kelly Sun used uh, to do this were approved casino cards that the casinos had been using for years. All right, casinos know that there are sort problems with cards, but since it normally doesn't come into play, they choose to ignore it. Now these games were mini baccarat games, which means the dealer is the only one to touch the cards unlike blackjack. Yeah, and, and the difference between mini Baccarat and regular Baccarat is in mini Baccarat, the dealer touches everything. Only thing the players touch are their chips and they put it in player banker. On the regular Baccarat tables, that's like what I was talking about earlier in Macau where they deal them directly to the players and that's when the players were bending them and all that kind of stuff because they were superstitious, right? That's correct. And we, we call the, uh, the other form uh, we have mini baccarat, they don't touch their cards, and then we have the squeeze game. Mm -hmm. And squeeze is where the players squeeze and they get in there and they look and they do it for, for good luck. And they it looks like you know they're gonna look like a dip chip when they get done, mm -hmm. right? But they completely destroy them. So, matter of fact, with and this is important for this conversation, when you have a squeeze game, they get rid of the cards immediately after the game's over with. So they no, they don't, they're not reused. In the mini Baccarat, they reuse the cards, all right? So if we're going to have the dealer sort them, we use that information after the shuffle and when the cards come back into play for the second and subsequent rounds, okay? So that's very important. Now, what they did was the cards that they used were blemished. Everybody knew that. They have a procedure for the dealers to turn the cards over. But because Phil Ivey was Phil Ivey, they requested some change to the procedures, which the casinos granted. And so they said, we want the dealers to turn it over a certain way. Now they told them it was for superstitious reasons, right? But the casinos granted this. Now, one thing about Brigada, 
was that Brigada, he, like I said, he went in and played four different times. When he played the first time, they showed him what they wanted and they got the dealers to do it. When, when Phil Ivey notified Brigada he was coming back for a second trip, management actually took a handful of dealers aside and taught them how to do this for him. Wow. Good old customer service, right? So when they say that, that, first of all, he was marking cards, he's using their cards. Yeah, they manipulated him into doing this, but they had plenty of time to change. Each time he kept coming in, they'd bring the dealers back that had been trained and they would deal the game. So they were just handing him the game. Um, well, that's crazy. I didn't, I didn't know that. The fact that Borgata trained the dealers for him is even crazier. Well, you, one thing about it, and I don't, you know, there's a lot of issues here, is that the regulators and the judge Actually, regulators knew what was going on in Atlantic City, and they didn't even invest. They investigated it and said, "No, it, there's no cheating." But the judge doesn't really know about gambling. That. He doesn't understand that. The lawyers don't really understand gaming, and even though they get a whole experts, because I did testify for the for the defense on this case, right? Uh, I didn't testify. I just I gave my uh, I gave a statement. They didn't even depose me, um, but. They don't really know, okay? So they, and, and, and when, you, when you work with attorneys, they have their own way of doing things. So unless you can convince them other than that, they're gonna do it that way. I don't, I, you know, I'm not, I'm, I won't wanna talk bad about the, the attorneys on the case, but I don't think they presented this in the light that they should have presented it. So in b- both these situations in, in Croxford's in England, in a Brigade in Atlantic City, they used the cards that were on the table that were approved and they were able to get management to okay the changes in procedures. I don't see how that's a crime. All right, well, the, the bottom line for me, I always thought was, well, if, if there was a crime, they would have arrested them and, and no one was ever arrested. So I, I, I mean, I guess it had to be a, an advantage play. So of course we all agree with you. Yeah. And well, I kind of think the same way because the same thing is uh, an advantage play that people do all the time, uh, not all the time, but in uh, on tables is hole carding. And that's when you have a sloppy dealer and you can see some of the cards, the face down cards as they're dealing them. And that's not considered cheating because they say that it's it's an error on the casino side and and you're just exploiting that. So I don't see how this isn't the exact same thing. No, I, I, that was one of my arguments. Mm-hmm. The same thing is, is that um, you got to remember that the Phil, Phil Ivey, again, I'm going to say this one more time, is not the brains of this operation. Kelly's son represented the team that was the brains of it. And it was another advantage player. And I believe he's from Australia. I'm not going to go into who he is. Um, but he put together these teams and they went in and played similar to this in Las Vegas for 10 and a half months before they were stopped. Okay. And they used, they used the same thing, but none of the, they, they used the cards and they got, matter of fact, they, they made a different change to the procedures. It was even worse for the casinos, but they understood that this was not a crime. Those casinos understood that this was an advantage play and never went after Kelly's son and the rest of the players for, uh, for uh, a civil or criminal case. Yeah, what's interesting is because uh, Borgata paid him, and then I remember this. I remember this going through the news, and then I think they had originally like just asked for all the comps back, and then I think that when they saw that Crockford's did the same thing and won, they got uh, kind of uh, ballsy and were like, "Well, if they won, then we should be able to win too." There's a legal precedent there. Well, first of all, Borgata, and I don't like that. You know. These, the, the people that are there, the guys that are working in the pit, working in surveillance are good people, okay? Uh, but they let this go through. They didn't catch it. And the only reason they caught Phil the fourth time was because the Crotsford's case had just come down. And they found out about the Crotsford's wouldn't pay him through the news, middle of his fourth play at Brigada, right? Oh, they wouldn't okay. Have even known it. They wouldn't even have known that he'd done this. He could have gone into perpetuity for that matter. Wow. He might still be playing there. <laughs> the, Crawford, the Croxford's play, right? Now, 
the Kronks first play, how did they snap to it? Well, they snapped to it because when Phil was leaving, he says, just send me my money, wire me my money. And one of the floormen said, he was looking at the cards. He says, you know what? I'm watching them turn them. I think that what they're doing is they're spinning them around. And he showed them the sorts on the cards. And that's when Crockford snapped to it, was after Phil left. They went back and reviewed the tapes, watched them turn the cards and figured out that's what he was doing. All right, well, well this was a, a great uh, interview. Talk about one of the greatest scandals in the history of uh, casino gambling. So, definitely in definitely in my lifetime and probably of of all time maybe would you say this is one of the biggest uh, casino scandals ever bill yeah you know what it is because we got it, it has all the the sexy elements it's got a big name poker player it's got uh, a uh, lot of with a strange asian girl and they're playing in england london england and they come back and they play atlantic city uh, and then it's drawn out and you've got judges involved and attorneys involved in a, and we're talking big money. So it's a sexy case to begin with. So yeah, this, this would probably be one of the bigger ones. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, if, if people want to get more information about you and, and your uh, consulting business, how would they do that? Uh, they get a hold of me through my website, uh, which would be billzender.com, billzender.com, or through my email. They can email me, which is w. Z-E-N-D-E-R at AOL.com. Shows you how old I am. Okay, you, uh, you are a great guest. Thanks very much for being with us. And I wanted to tell people that uh, we plan two more interviews with you. One is going to be on uh, five ways to make money in a casino, legally make money in a casino. And uh, the other one, Matt, do you... <laughs> it's going to be five uh, things you shouldn't do to make money in a casino. <laughs> there you go. Oh, yeah, that, that, cool. that one. The, 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 five, one the, five, the five biggest uh, casino cheating scandals. Yeah. So, so we have those on, on in the future. Bill, thanks again very much for being with us, and we look forward to talking to you again. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate it. Okay, take care. All right, so that does it for our interview with Bill Zender. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. Uh, leave us a comment below. Let us know what you think. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you never miss out on any of our other great videos. And don't forget, we have a new website, AmericanCasinoBonuses.com. If you'd like to go out and try out internet casinos, we have about 30 offers out there. You don't have to put in any credit card information or make any deposits. You can try them out for free. Again, AmericanCasinoBonuses.com. Thanks again very much for watching and best wishes for good luck in the casinos.